hello. Welcome to my seventh Duo Science in Australia video, which is going to be the last one I make from Australia. Sadly, my time is ending here way too soon. Um, my four months of beautiful Australia time are wrapping up. I am still collecting data on my bobtail research right up until the very end. I'm getting gene expression information and brain imaging, and I'm gonna have a lot of analysis to do when I get back to Ohio. Um, so I don't have any big conclusions to share with you, although I'm happy to post an update at some point in the future on that. Before I get into today's video, I'm going to acknowledge the Ingera, Turabal, and Kwandamuka people as the traditional owners and custodians on the lands of which I have worked and learned during my time in Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. It has been a privilege to live here and learn about the beautiful flora and fauna of these lands, as well as to learn some about the cultures of the Aboriginal people. So one of the best things about my time in Australia has been learning about Australian wildlife, not just the cephalopods, but all the animals in the water, on the land and in the air. And so today, what I want to do with this last video is count down for you my top 10 Australian animal encounters and give you some amazing facts about each of these critters. But why does Australia have such unique wildlife? You might say, oh, it's because it's an island and you would be right. Being an island and being isolated from other land masses is a huge part of the reason why Australia's wildlife is so unique and interesting. But that's not the whole story. So Australia used to be part of a southern supercontinent called Gondwana. Gondwana was made up of the land masses that became South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and India. They were all glommed together. And at that time, the land that became Australia and Antarctica that was actually all covered in tropical rainforest but about 100 million years ago, due to plate tectonics, those continents were all drifting apart from each other, breaking apart, separating. And Australia, as it drifted away, its climate changed. Rainforests retreated to just one little section on the East Coast, and the whole center and western part of the country became arid grassland and desert. So the animals that roamed across Gondwana, including mammals, um, reptiles, birds, even dinosaurs, right, that roamed across Gondwana, they were isolated in Australia, then were isolated for a hundred million years, during which time there was all this climate change. So different evolutionary pressures, different selection occurred, different mutations happened. And that is how Australia took what used to be common wildlife from Gondwana, and it evolved into the unique set of animals we find in Australia today. Animal encounter number one, koala bear. I was able to hold a koala at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, and I spotted some in the wild on North Stradbrook Island. These icons of Australia are, of course, marsupials. That means they're mammals with fur who lactate, creating milk for their babies. But marsupials give birth to very small, underdeveloped babies. Those tiny babies have to crawl from the vagina to the pouch, where they will latch onto a nipple and continue developing. These images are actually from a wallaby because I couldn't find any footage of koala births. They happen very quickly and unannounced. Koalas are tree-dwelling herbivores eating eucalyptus leaves, and they smell kind of sweet and eucalyptus-y. Animal encounter number two, kangaroo. Another icon of Australia and another marsupial. It's not hard to find kangaroos in Australia. It's like finding deer in Ohio. You spot them in farm fields and golf courses, and even occasionally someone's lawn at dawn or dusk. You can also get up close to them in petting zoos. Believe it or not, they are way softer than koalas, but more likely to kick you. So don't try to pet the wild ones. Animal encounter number three, the wombat. A favorite marsupial in my family is the wombat. We got to see them up close at zoos and sanctuaries that we visited. These guys are like giant groundhogs. They dig burrows and will happily eat your garden. They poop cubes, no lie. And for about a million years, ending about 40,000 years ago, the Diprotodon, a 7,000 pound, six foot tall wombat roamed around Australia, like a marsupial bison grazing in Australia. Man, I would have loved to see one of them. Animal encounter number four, the platypus. 
Another mammal, but not a marsupial this time. The platypus is an amazing creature. My birthday present for my family this year was a special encounter that let me feed the platypuses at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. Best birthday ever. I didn't get too close to them because the males have a venomous spur that causes tremendous pain that lasts for days to weeks and can't be blocked by any known pain drug. That would not be an awesome birthday present. To understand what a platypus is, you need to know that there are three kinds of mammals, placentals or eutherian mammals, marsupials, and monotremes. One of the key distinctions is how the fetus grows. Placental mammals, like us and most other mammals you can think of from dogs to dolphins, have a well-formed placenta in the uterus to nourish the fetus. Marsupials that we already talked about have a very minimalistic placenta and instead protect and feed the fetus in their pouches. Finally, monotremes, no pouch, no placenta. Instead, they put their fetus in a soft, leathery egg. The egg is incubated inside the mother's body for about 28 days with the mother's body sharing nutrients through the egg because it's permeable, not made of a calcified eggshell like birds. Then she lays the egg and incubates it for about another 10 days. Finally, the baby platypuses hatch hatch out, but they stay in the burrow and feed on milk for several months. Living monotremes include the platypus and the echidna, also found in Australia and some nearby islands. Here's my amazing platypus fact for you. They dive into fresh water, streams, and ponds to find small animals like crayfish and insect larvae to eat. When they dive underwater, they close their eyes, close off their ears, and hold their breath. Thus, they can't see, smell, or hear their prey. So how do they find their food? They have electrosensors in their bill that let them sense the electrical impulses associated with muscles moving and hearts beating in their tiny prey, like finding your dinner by EKG. Seriously awesome. For animal encounter number five, you gotta look up. It's the flying fox. One more mammal on my top 10 list, flying foxes. I sometimes walk from my apartment in Brisbane down to the river to watch the bats flying over at night. They're just beautiful. These are mega bats. They're placental mammals, and they're about the size of a large crow or a seagull. They eat fruit and nectar, and unlike microbats, they don't echolocate. They use good vision and good smell to navigate and find food. These guys hang upside down in the trees all day, chattering and grooming. And when the sun goes down, they disperse and feed at night. Up, because the animal number six, parrots, specifically lorikeets. Australia is home to more than 50 species of parrots, including sulfur-crested cockatoos, black cockatoos, galas, and lorikeets. I've been here four months and seeing cockatoos and lorikeets flying by when I'm out and about still feels pretty incredible. But really it's the hearing, not the seeing. Parrots are loud. On Stradbrook Island in the late afternoon, hundreds of rainbow lorikeets gather to roost for the night and spend a lot of time yelling at one another. I hear them from the lab about 4 p.m. and think, oh, it's lorikeet o'clock. Animal encounter number seven is another bird, but look out there, this one. It's the cassowary. If you've ever been unsure of this whole line of evidence that birds descended from dinosaurs, I'd like to introduce you to the cassowary. These are five to six foot tall flightless birds, and they're relatives of emus and ostriches. They live in the rainforests of northern Queensland. They are considered the most dangerous bird in the world because they can run up to 30 miles per hour, jump up to seven feet in the air, and have a powerful kick with four inch long dagger-like claws. They can absolutely kill you. So I was not petting these guys, but I did see them at the zoo. And I've been taking cassowary selfies in museums and gift shops around Australia to entertain my family. Animal encounter number eight, it's got eight arms. What else could it be? Octopus! On my second trip to the Morton Bay Research Station, I was looking for bobtail squid and pajama squid. Winsung and I had only found two bobtails all week, but we did find three different species of octopus. Let me introduce you to the red spot night octopus, genus Callistoctopus. This nocturnal octopus can change its coloration to be red with white spots, all red, or white with red spots. 
We caught two of this species and they were pretty quiet by day. But as soon as the sun went down, they were very curious and active, trying to escape from their tank. Next up is this adorable little diurnal octopus from the genus Abdopus. This guy is smaller than the red spot and camouflages very well to the sandy bottom. It would swim back and forth in front of the aquarium while watching me while I watched it. The third species of octopus that we found is the blue line octopus, Papaloclina fasci fasciata, named for the iridescent blue lines and spots that they flash when they're feeling threatened or annoyed. We found several of these, including a mature male, a juvenile, and a hatchling. These guys are the highly toxic ones I talked about in my previous video. They inject a paralytic when they bite that can paralyze their prey, or you. We handled them with a lot of care and also posted a lot of warning signs. Animal encounter number nine. Australia is well known for sharks. This is not the most dangerous shark. Number nine is the Wobegong. While out searching for cephalopods at night, I saw all kinds of other animals. One of my favorites was the Wobegong shark. These are carpet sharks, with their name Wobegong coming from an aboriginal word for shaggy beard. They're ambush predators lying in wait on the bottom, camouflaged to the sand, and ready to chomp on any unsuspecting fish that swim too near. They're not aggressive toward humans, although you should certainly not try to touch or harass them. And animal encounter number 10. Save the best for last. Number 10 is coral. Corals are tiny individual animals, measured in millimeters, called polyps. They live in colonies of identical polyps created through asexual reproduction, and each polyp in the colony secretes calcium carbonate. Collectively, the colony forms a coral structure that can be measured in centimeters to meters. Over time, corals die off and new corals grow on top of the old skeletons, and reefs are formed. These reefs then become the basis for thriving ecosystems. There are small corals right off of Morton Bay Research Station that I saw while out collecting specimens. But to see what corals can do, I needed to head north. I flew to Cairns and booked a dive trip that would take me out to the Great Barrier Reef, the largest coral reef in the world. I went on two dives going down over 60 feet and also did some snorkeling on the surface between dives. The reef structures were huge, all the way from the bottom at 60 feet, right to the surface. There were so many different species of coral and fish showing off the vast biodiversity. I saw lionfish and gray reef sharks, clownfish in their anemones, sea cucumbers that were more than a meter long and thicker than my leg. I've snorkeled and dived before, and frankly, the weather was terrible when I was in Cairns, causing rough seas and lower than normal visibility. But still, I was in awe seeing the reef and thinking how this reef st system stretches more than 133,000 square miles, all built by tiny coral polyps. Unfortunately, the reef is in serious danger. Climate change is already doing significant damage to the reef and further threats are looming. Warming water, chemical pollution, and ocean acidification are all damaging the reef and could lead to collapse of this incredible ecosystem. What can we do? Reduce our carbon footprint and ask our government and institutions to reduce fossil fuel use to slow global warming and ocean acidification. Limit pollution by using fewer single-use plastics and learning about the impacts of agricultural practices on water systems. Farm runoff is a huge problem for the Great Barrier Reef and for our waterways and lakes in Ohio. If you go to a place where there are corals, use only mineral-based reef-safe sunscreens. You can also get involved with citizen science through Coral Watch, a worldwide reef monitoring program based here at University of Queensland. I'll put links in the description below and in the credits if you'd like to learn more about coral reefs, the threats, the threats they face, and how to help. Thank you so much for joining me exploring some biology and science in Australia. I have had just an amazing time. I hope you are inspired to go have adventures of your own, whether they're around the world or just around the corner. Um, there's things to learn and explore everywhere you look. So all the best. Thanks again and goodbye from Australia.